So I want you to turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, as we get into God's Word. And I'm going to unpack something that, that uh, uh, doesn't get shared uh, that much simply because the, 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 the narrator is, is writing a lot about Abraham. And Abraham is, ha, ha, and Sarah has just had their child, uh, Isaac. Everybody say Isaac. Now you got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, I love the fact that God wants to give us his promise. But you have to, I have to lay a foundation of where I'm going. Because in Genesis 21, it had been all over 25 years. 25 years earlier, God spoke to Abraham and told him that he would be the father of many nations when he didn't even have a son. How many... Know that God sees what you're becoming, not just what you are. And I'm so thankful I serve a father like that. That I feel barren, weak, and empty, but he sees me full. And because of that, God gave him a promise that when he was 75 years old, that you're going to have a son. But 25 years went by and there was no son. During that 25 years, in the middle of that 25 years, on the 10th year of that 25 years, Sarah could not wait. And how many know that you and I have gotten in trouble because of our impulse? Because there's a, there's a prophetic timetable to everything that God does. Because God can prophesy over you about something. But there's a timetable that God has. And we have to have the, the wisdom and the patience and the fruit of the Spirit to understand that there's a timing for every prophetic word. But because Sarah could not wait for the promise, she decides to make it happen by herself. She decides to say, hey, Abraham, why don't you sleep with my maidservant Hagar? Perhaps I can have a son through her and I'll be satisfied. And that produced Ishmael. But now in Genesis 21, now that she got her Isaac, she can now be begin to throw away or, or what I call just get rid of her, her mistake. But ladies and gentlemen, hear me. There's some things we have to understand. There's some mistakes we can't get rid of. People aren't disposable. Come on. Are you hearing me? Hagar has a heart. Ishmael is Abraham's son. Come on, church. And God is a God of covenant. And I'm here to tell you the covenant of God is bigger than our mistakes. So oh, come on, church. And in that, in that place, here is Sarah who now literally has her Isaac and now she's upset. Because every time she sees Hagar and every time she sees Ishmael, it reminds her of her lack of patience, her inability to wait on the timing of God. So what she decides to do, because now she's angry at Ishmael and she's angry at Hagar, and this is what she does. She wants her husband to get rid of them. Now, church, I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't want to get rid of nobody. I've heard the most radical testimony I ever heard this afternoon. Because people want to get rid of people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But God doesn't want to get rid of anybody. Are you hearing me? Because he's a God of a covenant. And what had happened, because I, I'm going to ask you a question. How many have ever been in a dilemma? Come on. And, and you had to make a decision about a situation knowing that whatever decision you made, somebody was going to feel rejected. Welcome to leadership. Welcome to parenting. Come on. Because no matter what you do, somebody is going to feel rejected. Somebody's going to feel marginalized. Somebody's going to feel unwanted. Come on, church. 
And here, are you there? I want you to turn to Genesis 21, verse 10, as we get into this message tonight, because this is what it says. Sarah is talking to Abraham. And listen to what he says. He says, she, and she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son. Now, now, now church, hear, hear me. You, I, we're going to come back to this in a moment. Because at this moment, Meliana, here, here's what's happening at this particular moment. At this moment, she doesn't even call Hagar by name. She doesn't even call Ishmael by name. Which means she doesn't even see them as, as anything value. She sees them as something disposable. Church, everybody that comes in here, come on. We can't just treat them as somebody that doesn't have a name. They have value in the eyes of God. So what she does is she now says, hey, I want you to get rid of my mistake. Oh, come on. I want you to get rid of my mistake. I want you to get you to get rid of the time where I was impatient. You know why? This is what she said. Because you feel her own insecurity coming out of this verse. And she said, get rid of that slave woman and her son. Listen to this. For that one son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. Everybody say inheritance. Now, wait a minute. My inheritance is given by God. And my God has enough inheritance for my children and your children. So I don't need to be threatened by your anointing. I don't need to threaten if you can prophesy it better, preach it better, sing it better, do it better, because you know what? I've got my own inheritance. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because God's got enough inheritance for everybody. I don't have, I don't have to be threatened from the church down the street that's bigger than I am and I'm smaller because God's got an inheritance for this house and for your house. Are you hearing me? I don't have to worry about whether they're going to take this people and that people and take this thing because God himself has always given me an inheritance. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But insecure people feel threatened that what is there. Oh. Now, now when I look at this, you know what you know what she's doing? She's living in a place of poverty when by today's standards she is a billionaire. You know, rich people can live in a spirit of poverty. She's wealthy. It says that Abraham was wealthy. When the Bible says wealthy by today's standards, that's a billionaire. So here he is, ladies and gentlemen, and she's worried about her son's inheritance when there's enough inheritance for Ishmael and enough for Isaac and enough for her and enough for everybody else. But when you live in a place of scarcity, you hold on to what God's given you and you don't release what God's given you to others. So now, here is Abraham. I mean, you're talking about his son here. I can't just get rid because I'm going to tell you something what I would do. You know what I would do? I love you, Sarah, but right now, you need to get up the altar, and you need to come to the prophetic conference and rhyme back I, and just sit in the presence when James Louis is on that piano, and you need to sit there and get delivered. Come on. And then we'll have all the folks lay hands on you. I'll get Ty over here, have him put his paw right on your forehead and deliver you from your bitterness right now. You know what I'm saying? And, and, what, and, and what's going to happen, I would say absolutely, you're, you're, you're talking crazy because, girl, you've got resentment. You've got all kinds of issues. Forget that. But, ladies and gentlemen, Abraham does something that seems to me, because sometimes we have a tendency to react to the situation without praying first. And I love what Abraham does. Because what Abraham does is Abraham goes to God. Because I'm going to build, I'm going to take you somewhere tonight. I, he goes to God to find out what God says about the matter. And it says in verse 12 that God said to him, listen to this. Do not be so distressed. Everybody say that. Do not. Do not. Actually, turn to your neighbor. Say, do not be so distressed. 
Because, because we could put the mic down and say, you got a word right now. Because how many know we live in a culture that shows stress? Now, in Iowa, you don't have any traffic. Uh, and, and I won't tell you what the pastor's wife did on the way to church. <laughs> but you don't have traffic in, in Iowa. Come on. But it doesn't matter what, what brings stress to us. It's not necessarily the tra car traffic. It's the relational conflict that we have to deal with day in and day out. And that's what brings stress on our hearts. Come on. Yeah. That here I am. I was minding my own business, living my own life. I thought everything was hunky-dory. I thought everybody was cool in my house. And now you want me to get rid of my son. That would stress me out too. But what would God do? He says, Abraham, do not be so distressed. Because I'll tell you something. When we are distressed, we can't hear God correctly. Because then we filter everything through our stress. And so then we, 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 we get bits and pieces because our stress is overcoming us and it's drowning our ear out from hearing the pure word of God. So he does not be so distressed because here's the thing. Abraham is stressed about the now. Sometimes God's people have been so stressed about the now because they don't see tomorrow. And God sees tomorrow. And when you, that's why you need a prophecy. Because your now is pulling you down into stress. But the prophecy is pulling you up into your future so you can see that what you're going through right now is not permanent, it's temporary. I feel like preaching now. Because sometimes we think that what we're going through and what we're walking through is forever. It is not forever. You're going to be in a different place next year. You're going to you're going to have you're going to have other experiences next year. The church is going to be in a different place. You're going to be in a better place than you were this year. The if we have the conference next year, the conference will be greater next year than it was this year. There's going to be more of an anointing, more deliverance, more freedom, more salvation. Why? Because I am not descending. I'm ascending. Come on, uh, are you hearing me? And I may be going through a moment of stress right now, but it's not forever. See, I didn't like when I when my daughter's calling me every night crying. Most half of the year in 2017, I didn't like it, but I knew one thing: there's going to be a day when she's not going to call me crying and call me prophesying over me. Well, come on, church, are you hearing me? So, do not be so distressed. God's got to tell them that. I'm going to, I want to quiet your soul on this. Now, listen to this. Not be so distressed about the boy and the woman. And this is, can you put this up? Well, you got it up here. I like it. He goes on top of it. Thank you. Now, Pastor Oscar. And congregation, will you forgive me right now what I'm going to say? Just hold, just don't take it personal. The next sentence, I wish I could erase it. Because this is what it says, Gail. Listen to whatever your wife tells you. <laughs> I mean, here I am. I'm going to the Lord. My wife's so upset. Come on. Sarah wants to get rid of my son and a woman who has been a victim. Come on. And completely get rid of them, reject them, marginalize them, put them down, devalue them, push them out of the house. And you want me to listen to whatever Sarah says? I rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> I don't listen to Meliana. <laughs> Until I read that word. <laughs> but hear me. You've got to see this. When he got that word from God to listen to what Sarah told him to get rid of Hagar and Ishmael, 
when I read that, that's outside of God's character. Isn't God a God of love? Isn't he a God of grace and forgiveness? Why would you tell me to do something that is outside your character? Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens. Sometimes we get locked in to who God is. And if God speaks outside of who we think he is, we don't listen to that voice. Oh, come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because, again, we see the pain. We see the pain of having to let go. When God has a plan for Hagar and Ishmael that we are not even aware of, and God is using this negative situation and is going to turn around for good and what seemingly seems so horrible, so, so, so even demonic in nature, God is working through all this to get Hagar and Ishmael into a place where they've never been before. Come on. Are you hearing me? Be because it could have been worse had they stayed under the, under the hand of Sarah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And it could be that right now you are in a place in your life and you are wondering, man, this is the most horrible thing that I have ever walked through in my life. Well, I'm here to tell you it is not the most horrible thing because God's about to turn things for you. God's about to turn things around for you. And what seemingly may be something that's so terrible in your life, life. God's going to use the whole thing to show his glory, show his power, release an anointing on you that you didn't even know you had. Oh, hear me, hear me. Hear me when I, because, because how many know that I am most powerful when I'm spoken out of my rejection? out of my wound, out of my pain, out of my personal experience. That's when there's an anointing. How many know that when Megan got up and shared what she shared, there is an anointing that came on her? Right. Now, at the moment, it was terrible. Come on. But God put an anointing on that old I feel like preaching. Listen to whatever Sarah said. Is that you, God? Because now I've got to get rid. Because you got to understand, Hagar has grown up, uh, grown, grown, and developed, uh, grown up, and she's been under the, the protection of, of Abraham all her life. She's never been on her own. So you got to understand this. Now we've already established that by today's standards, Abraham is a billionaire. Oh, no problem. Because, like, if you're like me, I got a secret stash that my wife doesn't know about. <laughs> Just in case of emergency. <laughs> Until she licks in my bag. <laughs> but, so, I mean, no problem. Because, because yes, I can, I can, what I can do is I can write $5 million check. Give them a thousand camels, give them an army, and I can release them, no problem. But what's amazing to me is what Abraham does. Because in verse 14, I want you to turn there, I want you to see this, you can put that up. It says, Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water. Everybody say, Some food and a skin of water. No, wait, no, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Abraham has a lot of food. Abraham has wells. And he's not giving her a lot of food and a well. He's giving her some food and only a skin of water. How many know we got a problem? How many know that that is not enough for two people to survive out into a desert. Let me tell you why I decided to preach this message here tonight. Because I can tell you this. How many know that the biggest thing that we need in the church today isn't more programs? Isn't more church growth books? Come on. 
isn't more ideas. Come on. Because I don't know about you, but he's sending her out in a desert. Now, I can have a $5 million check in my hand in the desert, but I can't really get to the bank if I have no water. Oh, hear me, hear me, hear me. Because the issue is not some food. The issue is the skin of water here. Church, I want to tell you what has taken place here this past few days. Because the greatest thing, the greatest need in the church now is not just great leadership. It is the water of the Spirit. Because in order to get you, in order to survive through the desert season of your life, you better make sure you have water. And all she has is a skin of water. So basically, she sent out Daniel with an inadequate supply. How many are tired of inadequacy? Oh, come on. I'm tired of inadequacy. I don't have enough, God. And in that place, some food and a skin of water. This is what, I mean, it, it, it's not like today. She ain't got the new iPhone. She doesn't have an iPhone X like sister over there sitting there. That means he don't got no GPS. Abraham didn't say, oh, by the way, Hagar and Ishmael, you know what? Walk there a mile, turn right, then turn left, and there's an oasis right there. There's enough for you to supply. He doesn't even give her a sense of direction. This is what it says. And a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He sent them on her shoulders. Everybody say her shoulders. We talked about shoulders tonight. But wait, I, I'm going to a different direction. How much can a single woman carry on her own? How much water can she carry for her teenage son and her? On her shoulders. And the Bible says that he put it on her shoulders and sent her off with the boy. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this. Because it, and then it says, then it says, and she went on her way and wandered. Everybody say wandered. wandered. In the desert of Beersheba. So now, how many know that there's going to be a problem? How many know there's going to be a problem? Because you can't wander in the desert for very long. Pretty soon... The water supply that you're carrying is going to go down. Now, church, I will tell you this. You know why I told your pastor I would come here and come back? I will tell you why. Because the state of Iowa and the assemblies of God don't just need more ideas. They need spiritual water because our body, our body is made up of mostly water. Come on. Because I can tell you this. Now, I understand the heat because let me tell you something what happened a few years ago. We happened to drive all the way from California, all the way to Quad Cities one year, and then down to Kentucky because we carried our bikes. And this was years ago. We were doing triathlons, and we went on a 60-mile ride over there in Quad Cities. And, and, and we went up, and they, they, they said they had hills in Illinois. They don't have hills in Illinois. I found that out. They have hills in California, but not in Illinois. And so, so we're on this ride, and we went with one of the board members of, a ch of the church. And my, Meliana already know we. He was an experienced rider. Uh, we were on, and we were drinking Gatorade like because it, it was super hot. This was the summertime. It was in July, super hot. We're out in the middle of the day, riding through the cornfields, and all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, as Meliana, the three of us are riding, and the, our friend that's with us says, "Hey, you guys go ahead because we're about 10, 15 miles." from where we are going to rendezvous. And so my wife and I speed ahead. And then we, 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 we get to the park where our car is. We, we, we load the bikes in the car. And we, and we start waiting and waiting and waiting. And our friend does not show up. And finally, after like 20 minutes, I, I, I'm thinking, where is he? Because he should have been right behind us. And so, so, so all of a sudden, I tell Melian, I'm going to need to bring the bike out. And as soon as I bring the bike out, I look down the trail along the Mississippi, and here he comes on the bike, and he's wobbling like he's drunk. 
What he was is he was dehydrated. Are you hearing me? Because how many know that when you're dehydrated, your motor functions don't work correctly? Oh, come on. Your, your ability to think, your, your, you don't have the vision, you get confused, you don't have to know how to make decisions. And this is why we need water in the church. This is why we need water of the Spirit in the church. This is why we need a prophetic conference. This is why you need a healing evangelist. This is why you need to move the Spirit. Because we don't need a body of Christ to be confused and spiritually dehydrated. Can I hear an amen? amen. Are you hearing me? And he's wobbling, and finally we get him. We had to call his wife because they sent him to a hospital. Praise God, he made it through. But, but dehydration, because it comes worse and worse. So now, here is Hagar with only a skin of water and a teenager. But, not, but here's something bigger than the skin of water. She's rejected. Because rejection drains you emotionally where it actually takes the water right out of your soul. That all of a sudden you find your identity through your rejection, not through your promise. And, that, and, she's, and now she has to, how does a mother explain to her 17-year-old son, because Ishmael is probably 16 or 17, how does she explain to Ishmael, oh, your dad doesn't want you anymore? How does she do that? And sometimes we don't understand people's stories. And sometimes we judge them by their appearance. But we, because, but we don't know the depth of the rejection that they have gone through. And we don't know because that we look at the behavior rather than investigate long enough to see the story and find the root cause. You'd have a chip on your shoulder if your daddy left you. Oh, come on. You'd have an attitude if, you're, if you didn't understand that nobody wanted you, nobody wanted you, and you didn't do anything. And then you had this stepmother that hated you. And so now we know what's going to happen because I want you to hear this. Because I'm going to camp out in a verse in just a moment. In verse 15 it says, it says, James, when the water in the skin was gone. Everybody say when the water was gone. Oh, Jesus, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful I got a black man in Iowa that brings the presence of God wherever he goes. You know why? Because when he was singing, the Lord spoke to me. When he's worshiping and you're worshiping, the water is not going to be gone. Come on, church. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because when the water's gone, we're in trouble. And that is why my wife and I don't go home. That's why we live from hotel to hotel and hotel. And yes, it might have advantages. But the reason why we do what we do is as long as I'm alive, I don't want the water in the church to be gone. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, Daniel, I, 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 I'm not here to please man. I'm not here to have them open my door because I, I, I've been to some churches where the water was gone. Come on, are you hearing? You know what? Where the water was gone. And when there's no water, guess what's going on behind the scenes? In the green room, I can't repeat what, uh, what I say. You know why? Because there's no water in the church. But when there's water in the house, come on. When the Spirit of God is in the house, we don't have to about whether you wobbling through life. We don't have to worry about whether you're not going to make it to your destination. We don't have to call the hospital on because you're on life support system because the water of the Spirit has rained down on you. Come on. You know what I'm saying? When the water is gone. Ladies and gentlemen, when the water and the skin was gone, that's, that, that's why we have to make this commitment. How many Spirit-filled people here in this house? Only half of you? All of you should be raising your hand. Let me, let me tell you. We have to make it a sense of commitment. As long as I'm alive, I'm not going to let the water be gone. Church, that's why I don't care what size of church I go to. I don't care where I go to. Because I don't want the water to be gone. Because I know what's going to happen to the soul. I know what's going to happen to a movement. And I'm going to tell you something. If we don't see a shift. Come on. If we don't see a shift in our movement. 
then here's what's going to happen. We are going to be on life support systems. Come on. Rely on the world to cure our problem when all we, when we have access to the Holy Spirit. When the, it says when the water was gone. Yeah. Now, listen to this. When the water is gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. In other words, this is what she did. Because she had no water, she couldn't make a right choice. So because she's been rejected, that's all she knows how to do is reject others. So she puts her own son, who she was supposed to take care of. Are you hearing me? Because he, he is thirsty. And every time he cries for water, it reminds her that she doesn't have the water to give him. I can tell you Ishmael is crying in Rainbeck. Ishmael's are crying in Iowa. Oh, you hear me? They're crying out. They're crying out for water. People are crying out for water. What, what someone does at their church is up to them. But the bottom line, if I, if I were to go to any church that says, well, we don't believe in prophecy. We don't believe in tongues. We don't believe in this stuff. And those people are crying out for water. The world's crying out for water. Those women that come to her pregnancy center are crying out for water. My, my sister who's adopting children, those parents are crying out for water. Those kids are crying out for water. That whole culture is crying out for water. Let me tell you, the homosexual is crying out for water. The liberal who's got a picket sign that hates, hates our government, they're crying out for water. And the answer is the water of the Spirit raining down. Oh, hear me out. Oh, Jesus. They're crying out for water. And, and, and when the church doesn't have, doesn't have the water to meet its need, all we can do is leave them under a bush. I don't have an answer to the water, water shortage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my back on my responsibility. Now she's dealing with her own issues. She's dealing with her own rejection. Her husband rejected her. Sarah rejected her. That's all she has now know how to do. She doesn't know. How to, I mean, there's no Section 8, you know. She's out there by herself. There's no welfare. He didn't go, go, go down to the welfare station, said, Hagar. She has no access to anybody. She's out in the desert by herself, wandering. She's never been by herself before. She's always had people to help her get, get this. Always been others around her. She's never been alone. It's the first time she's had to be a single mother in her life. She always had help. She's Abraham's wife. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? So I, I guess the way I can do it when I can't meet the need, I'll just walk away. I thought about the mother you told me about. What's, your, what's the issue? The issue isn't drugs. The issue is rejection. That's why we needed an anointing to heal the rejection. That's why they need a prophecy. That's why, that's why we, we need, we, uh, church, that's why we need to be more afraid of not prophesying. Uh, than what we're going to say. Come on. Because I could prophesy and all of a sudden it could access the water of the Spirit in your life and your life could get transformed. So what I'm, uh, I'm going to walk away. And I'm going to walk far enough away so I don't have to hear your cry. Because sometimes in America... We can be within our four walls and we don't even hear the cry of culture. Now, church, let me just tell you, the news isn't the cry of culture. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You have to get on the street. You have to get where people are. You have to walk among the people to hear the cry of America. The news is not really a true perspective of the cry of the people. Now hear me, she walks far enough so she doesn't have to hear Ishmael anymore. So somehow she can escape her inability to give him the water that he needs to survive. The church, you know what's amazing about this story? Is that at this moment, 
when it looks like everything is over. When it actually looks like, Meliana, that there is no hope. When it looks like two people are going to die in the wilderness because of the rudeness and the cruelness of both Abraham and Sarah. And actually, it's how could God allow this? I, I'm telling you, that's when God shows up. Aren't you thankful that when you had no water, God showed up? When you were at the end of your rope, God showed up. When you had no access and you didn't know what to do, God showed up. Aren't you thankful tonight that when you had no money, God blessed you. When you had no job, God, God, God gave you a job. When you were sick, he healed you. Are you hearing me? And he set you free. Now hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Got to see this. Got to see this. And I stand behind this pulpit. You can turn to put 17 up there. Thank you, sound guys. You're doing a great job. I love this. I love this verse because, Meliana, these two words is the thing that champions my life. These two words is the very thing that, that fuels me every single day of my life. Two words. God heard. Everybody say, God heard. God heard. I stand here a free man because God heard. I'm delivered because God heard. I'm saved because God heard. I'm healed because God heard. My daughter's in ministry because God heard. My son's in ministry because God heard. My daughter-in-law's in, in ministry. And my granddaughter, who's 10 years old, prophesied for the first time. And she's going on her first mission trip. Are you? Because God heard. God heard. Listen to what it says. God heard the boy crying. Hagar didn't hear it. Sarah didn't want to hear it. Abraham was too indifferent to hear it. But God heard it. Aren't you thankful when nobody hears you? God hears you. How many have been married a long time? You say, aren't you hearing me, honey? Don't you hear me? Don't you hear me? No, no, I don't. I didn't hear you. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that when others tune out your voice, God doesn't tune out your cry. Yeah. When others don't listen to you, God listens to you. That's why I love him so. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God, everybody say an angel, angel. called to Hagar. Everybody say Hagar. Hagar. Notice the language here. The angel didn't say slave woman. The angel called her by her name. The angel called her what she was. The angel did not uh, marginalize her, tell her she's unloved or unwanted. The, the angel called her by name was something. God doesn't, God doesn't call people uh, 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 something or label people. He calls them by their name. Are you hearing me? And for those of you that want to know what that word Hagar means in the Hebrew, it means immigrant. Yeah. I won't go there. I ain't going there. I'm in Iowa. <laughs> if I was in California, I might go there. No. No. <laughs> no. The call, he called to Hagar from heaven. Not from the pulpit, from heaven. And said to her, now listen to this. What is the matter? Now, ladies and gentlemen, what if these last, what, well, one, two, how many services do we have? Five, something like that. These five services, every prophetic word over you that you were given is, what's the matter? What are you talking about? What's the matter? What kind of, I mean, that's her first prophecy. What's the matter? What kind of word is that? Lord, what do you mean, what's the matter? I can't pay my bills. I've been rejected. 
I have no water. I have no house. I'm homeless. I've left my son, my son a half a mile away. I can't hear his cry. And you, my, my husband's reject me. Uh, 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 there's so much anger. There's so much hatred. I have no food, no water, no money, no nothing. And you was asking me what's the matter. Have you got a reality check yet? <laughs> <laughs> See, the baby got it. The baby got it. <laughs> that was classic. What's the matter? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are so concerned by what we see, we don't have the faith to believe what we can't see. Because the fact is an angel is talking to you directly from heaven, not a prophet. And God sent an angel that's in his presence 24-7 down on the earth to speak to Hagar to ask her what's the matter. The fact that the angel is talking to you says you don't need to worry about your future, honey. You don't need to worry about tomorrow. I've got it all under control. You don't need to worry about your water shortage. I'm going to take care of your water shortage. I'm going to take care of your son. I'm going to take care of your future. And I just want to know because you know what? If you don't get out of your head, the stuff in your head right now, guess what's going to happen? You and your boy are going to die in this wilderness. Because what ma I, Because here's the thing. I mean, because here's what we want. Here's what happens. God... Because here's, here's the kind of prophecy we want. Right? I want you, God, to prophesy to my present need and my present situation. And right now, I want that prophet to call me out tonight, and he better prophesy about water. Because if he doesn't prophesy about water, he, because that's what I need right now, he must be a false prophet. Because if he were really a prophet, he'd have known that I need water right now because that's my immediate need. Church, sometimes we're so caught up in the immediate that we can't see the eternal. Oh, hear me, hear me, hear me. It's the immediate. It's this immediate time that it's weighing us down and stressing when God says, I'm going to take care of that. That's why I know that God's going to give Tracy and Jeff the property. That's why I know they're going to have a house to house kids and, and girls and women. I know that God's going to bless them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I know that hundreds of thousands of dollars are going to be sown into their ministry as they share the vision. I already know that. Come on. But sometimes we're in the middle of it. In the middle of it. What's the matter? Hagar. Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy as he, uh, uh, the boy crying as he lies there. Okay, I'm not afraid, but where's the water? <laughs> well, because you know what? Fear had gripped her so much that the fear of not being able to survive gripped her. So much that it paralyzed her. And what God wants to do is see, you got to understand this church has been called to break the grip of fear off of people. Because when they are not afraid, come on. See, this is why you got to get filled with the water of the Spirit. You remember this? See, we, see I, I realize that the initial evidence, I believe in this, that the initial evidence of being filled with the Spirit is speaking in tongues. But there's another initial evidence. It's called courage. It's called boldness. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? And sometimes we preach on tongues, but we don't preach on boldness. I got my heavenly language, but, but, but it's, only, it's only in my pride closet. I won't witness to anybody. Oh, come on, church. Because you got to understand when the, when the apostles in the book of Acts, when the Spirit fell on them, the first thing they got was courage. 
<laughs> you mean that I'm going to walk up to the place where I just got persecuted. I'm going to preach on that same corner whether they arrest me or not. Come on. I'm going to walk. Now, you got to understand, they, they, they walked right into the temple that Jesus was crucified. Come on. That was a sentence. Are you hearing me? They walked right up the temple and went to church and healed a man at Gay Beautiful. Come on. Are you hearing me? How did they do that? Because the Spirit of God does not give you a spirit of timidity. He uh, not a fear, but a spirit of a sound mind. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying, church? And what we need is a baptism of courage. Come on, a baptism of boldness, ladies and gentlemen. Because let me just tell you, the enemy knows when you're afraid. Because when you're afraid, you can't help anybody. When you was afraid, you won't witness. When you're afraid, you will not prophesy. When you've got boldness, come on. It's not arrogance. There's a difference. Not arrogance. Church, I mean, I got to prophesy over the speaker of the house in Lithuania, and she fell out. She's not even a Christian. And then, then, then her speaker, the, the, the interpreter asked me, can you pray for me too? And she fell out <laughs> in her room. They don't even come to church. They got up and said, what was that? <laughs> now, what if I would have been intimidated and didn't have the boldness because now I'm standing before a dignitary? Because let me tell you, church, this, when the Spirit of God comes on you, you're not afraid. Come on. And see, the problem is, is see, the fear of man is controlling pulpits all over America. Man, if I say that, he's not going to pay my tithe. And I'm not going to get my salary, and we're not going to be able to pay our mortgage on the church. That's, that is the fear of man, ladies and gentlemen. Let, let me tell you, if somebody holds their money like that, you can take your money. Why don't you give it to the casino? Because I don't want it. Come on. I'm not going to be manipulated by your giving. You're not going to be, just because you may be a billionaire, because it's not your money that supports the church. God will hold up my church because this is God's church. It's not just you. Oh, I feel like preaching right now. Because I've seen it. I'm a, I've seen it. This is how we're going. We're, I've seen it. We're going to hold back our tithes from the pasture because we want them out. It happens in AG churches. That's demonic in nature. Then people is not saved. Because if you were saved, you wouldn't hold back your tithe. I mean, I mean, I mean, some of the stuff I'm saying. But when you have divine courage, see, the angel had to tell Hagar, Mariana, had to tell Hagar because 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 she was afraid. She was alone in the wilderness. She, all of us find ourselves in wildernesses, but. If you're afraid in the wilderness, you're in trouble. But if you got courage in the wilderness, you will not stay in your wilderness. And tonight, God is going to break the spirit of fear off people. God is going to break the spirit of fear off people, and especially the fear of man. Now, church, I want to be, uh, I want to be loving. I want to be compassionate. I want to love people where they're at. I get that. But when it comes to certain things, we're, we're, we're drawing a line in the sand. We're not crossing over. I, I don't. I, I'm not here to play church. I'm not here to play religious games. We're here to build a kingdom. If you want to build a kingdom, come on over. Are you hearing me? Listen. He has to tell her, "Don't be afraid." God has heard the boy as he lies there. Now, here's the amazing thing: the beauty of prophecy. Here was a woman who had been disinherited by Abraham and by Sarah. But the beauty of a prophetic word is that God says, they may disinherit you, disinherit you, but I've just inherited you. I've just adopted you. You're mine. They may not want you, but I want you because I see you. Because I'm a God of covenant. And I made a covenant with Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. And you're, there's a nation inside of you. Now hear me. And I'm not going to violate my, my covenant just because Sarah doesn't like you. 
And you got to see this. In this next verse, I love this. Because let me just tell you, I want you to hear me very closely because this needs to be said. In 21 years of traveling all over the world, we have prophesied over thousands of people. And I must tell you, I have seen thousands of testimonies. But I've also seen thousands of words not come to pass. And some might say, well, that must have not been a true word of the Lord. But you've got to say, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Because here's the thing. Here's, here's a woman who, who there's no other human. She's the closest human being to Ishmael. She's the only one in the vicinity. And she's the only one, knows, a human being, that knows where Ishmael is. Come on. And sometimes I think that sometimes God will give us a word. He said, don't be afraid. What's the matter? I heard your cry. I'm answering your prayer. But he expects you and I to grow legs, put on legs to the word. Because the reason why prophetic words do not come to pass is that we don't never grow legs. But, but, but what I want, I, I don't want to just come and prophesy over you. I want God to put legs on you. Because when you walk it out, something happens in the spirit realm. Something takes place in the atmosphere. All of a sudden, your circumstances begin to line up with what God prophesied because you put legs on your word. Now hear me. So now the angel said, hey, you know, I hear the boys cry. I, 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 I Don't be afraid. But now the angel is giving, because you know what? Every prophecy is an instruction. Yeah. Are you hearing me? It's, everybody say instruction. So now, Meliana, Meliana, the, the angel has to give Hagar instructions. Listen to the instructions. And I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this, Mike. I want you to hear this, every, every leader. Every board member, every person, every worship leader, I want you to hear this. The instruction is, lift the boy up. Everybody say, lift the boy up. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, lift the boy up. <laughs> How many want this church to grow? How many want your ministry to grow? Come on. How many want your life to grow? How many want I I Iowa to grow? Come on. I almost said Idaho. You know, <laughs> I was in Idaho last month. <laughs> Iowa. Now, 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 hear me. Hear me what the angel says. You mean you want me when I don't have an adequate supply of water, when I got my own issues of rejection, when I got my own issues with Sarah and my husband and my son and I, my life's a mess and I don't even have a roof over my head and I should be on Section 8, but I'm not, I wasn't born in the United States in California in 2018. Are you hearing me? You mean you want me to lift the boy up? Yes, Hagar. Because I'm telling you something. If there's any time in human history that we need to lift people up, it's now. Come on. How many want to lift up this church? How many want to lift up this pastor? Come on. How many want to lift up your neighbor? How many want to lift up the people behind you and the people in front of you and the people on your right and people on your left? Can you imagine if we had a whole church that lifted each other up? Come on, if we lifted each other up instead of put each other down. Because, hey, when you have no water, that's when I need to lift you up. When you're dying of spiritual thirst, that's when I need to lift you up. And, and here, 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 because, here but, but see, here's what religion says. This is why I hate religion. Because religion says you can't lift anybody up until you get it together. Have you read that story yet? Have you read that the fact that Hagar, who had no water, the angel says, I want you to go over there to where you left your boy, and I want you to lift that boy up. Oh, come on. Here's what God is saying. I want you to lift up your city. 
I want you to lift up Rhinebeck. I want you to lift up your church. I want you to lift up your nation. What? I got issues. I got, I, I got my own rejection. In the middle of a rejection, this is what you're saying. My, the responsibility, the prophetic word, the angel spoke to me is more important than my issues. I've got to lift him up. Mm-hmm. Turn to your neighbor and say, lift him up. Lift him up. I have to, what is prophecy? Prophecy is lifting people up. Yes. Yes. Hear me. When we lift people up, because listen to what the angel say, lift the boy up and take him by the hand. Okay. Wonderful. I'm going to go back over there. I'm going to lift them up. And listen to what God's going to do if you lift them up. In other words, if you lift up your city, if you lift up your church, if you lift up your worship team, if you lift up your pastor and your pastor's wife, guess what God says? For I will make him into a great nation. Oh, 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 hear me, hear me. Could it be the greatness of the church that God wants to release on the earth isn't taking place because we are not lifting up the very thing that we're supposed to lift up. Because God already said that he wants to make you great. Oh, come on. Because it's like this couple. Here they are. I found out they're living in an RV right over there. No, 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 no. How many believe that God wants to make them great? Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I, I know where they're at. And you know what? If we don't lift them up, how are they going to be made great? Which means that I have a responsibility to make the people that walk into this church great. If you're a leader, you don't have the permission to put them down. You only have the permission to make them great. So the only way they're going to be made great, unless you lift them up. (laughs) Because it could be that God is releasing. Because God doesn't want just a church. He wants a great church. He doesn't want just a a good conference. He wants a great conference. What happens when we lift each other up? You want the worship team to be more anointed? Lift them up. Come on. You want your preacher to preach better? Lift him up. You want your husband to do better? Lift him up. You want your wife to do better? Lift him up. Oh, come on. See, I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to preach good because you can sit there and give me a dirty look because I ain't going to look at you. I'm going to look at her. Because, I, because she's my main man corner. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because I ain't never going to have a bad sermon. You know why I'm not going to have a bad sermon? Because I'm going to keep my eyes on the person that is lifting. Oh, uh-huh. oh, oh, hear me. I don't have time to have people putting me down. Oh, I mean to be lifted up. Because when I'm in lifted up, I feel powerful. I feel like I can take every devil. I can cast out devils, heal the sick, and raise the dead. I can walk on water. I can remove every mountain when I feel like, oh, when I'm lifted up. Now, what mother would not want her son made great? Listen to me here. How many board members in the house? What board member would not want their church to be great? So that means as a board member, I can't say anything that would diminish the greatness of any member or this church or any leader because I want to make them great. You think God put that in the Bible for my entertainment? I don't think so. He put, my, put that in the Bible so that I could emulate that. See, if I want my son great, I'm going to lift him up. If I want my daughter great, I'm going to lift her up. If I want Carissa, I want, if I want Carissa to be great, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna lift her up. She's easy to lift her up. Her, she weighs about two pounds. You know? <laughs> I can lift her up in my rejection, even when I'm thirsty. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, now, Mike, I'm gonna need some strength. <laughs> But listen here. Listen to here. This is not an option. This is not up for vote. This is not let's have a committee meeting and see if we're going to do this. Sometimes we have too many meetings 
that we forget we're called to lift people up. Let's have a board meeting, see if we're going to lift people up. I don't need to have a board meeting to lift people up when it's already in the Bible. Because every time you serve, you're lifting somebody up. See, the, those ladies that made all that food, you know what they're doing? They're lifting people up. Those nursery workers are lifting up. Those children's workers are lifting up. These ushers are lifting up. The, these, that, that drummer over there, that guitar over there, the piano's up there, that bass player, they're all lifting people up. Them singers, those songbirds are li- lifting people up. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? Every time you give, you're lifting people up. Gail's lifting people up. Come on. Don't matter if you're 80. It don't matter. No, I'm sorry, you're 18. I'm sorry I misdiagnosed your age deal but even if you're 18 like Gail come on because he's 18 it's hard because if you heard him talk to me I said man this guy's a bible encyclopedia (laughs) you know why every time he talks he's lifting somebody up your speech ought to lift people up your conversation ought to lift people up now lift him up and I'm going to make him great. Wow. Now I have to get over what I'm struggling with at that moment <laughs> real quick. So now that phone call of my daughter crying, you know what I'm going to do, devil? I'm going to go to church tonight and I'm going to prophesy over everybody. I'm going to lift people up. Now you hear me, you gotta hear this. Now it's almost 10 o'clock. We've been here almost, we've been here over three hours. These, these guys have been here five hours. That's too long. That's too long, Pastor. When you wanna make people great, it's never too long. Listen to this. This will be the last verse. It says, then God, everybody say then God, verse 19. It says, everybody say then God. God. Opened her eyes. Everybody say opened her eyes. Opened her eyes. Oh, oh, church, you got to see this. You got to see this. How many know when I told you that when you are dehydrated, your, your vision, your motor skills, they begin to diminish. So I saw something in that verse that I never saw before. That means that Hagar had to go back to the bush where she left Ishmael and she couldn't see it. So how could she find her boy? Well, every mother knows this. There could be 50 babies in here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And they all could be making noise. But you could be sitting right here and your child could be all the way in the back of the church and you would hear the distinct cry of that child. Oh, come on. Are you hearing me? So here, church, hear me what I'm going to tell you right now. That means she didn't have the vision. Yes, she didn't have water, but she but that means that the cry of Ishmael became her GPS guiding her back to where he was. Church, let me just tell you, when you see a tragedy, when you see people walk through something, when you hear a testimony, that should be enough. I should be guided by the cry of this culture. Come on. I should be guided by the cry of humanity. I should be cry, I should be guided by the cry of the thirsty. Are you hearing what I'm saying? No, I don't see everything what God is doing. No, even as a prophet, I don't see everything. But what I do is I hear the sound of sons and daughters crying for somebody to give them water, somebody to lift them up. Are you hearing me? That's what I hear. And sometimes you, sometimes in ministry, in life, in business, we don't see everything clearly. But that's when you've got to turn your ear to the cry of humanity and say, God, use me to, to end that cry, to heal that cry. Yeah. Yes, see, I got into ministry 21 years ago because I heard a cry. 
Because you've got to be crazy to leave Maui. Especially a church like that, because them people is crazy. They is, you know what? When, when revival hit our church in 1995, 2,000 people was running around the church, including the worship leader. You better run or you'll get run over. Stampede, man. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You talk about crazy. And then them 2,000 people, next thing you know, after they run, they all fell out. That's just, that's just the introduction. Demons cast out every Sunday. Really, I'm serious. My pastor's hand's about the size, like this guy's hand, huge. He lay hands on people, boom, demons manifest, they're delivered. He don't talk to you, don't ask their name or nothing. Why, why would you ask the demon his name? They're a liar. <laughs> Every Sunday, pa Pastor, if I got anything, lay your hand on me because I don't want no demons in me. Come on. Now, now church, I, I grew up in a place like that. But, but I hear a cry. I hear a cry. I hear a cry that God, I heard a cry from Maui all the way to the United States. I heard a cry. And I said, God, I heard a cry. Of an, I heard a cry when, when, when he asked me to come. I heard a cry. Yeah. A cry. I didn't know what was I going to get into. I didn't know what happened. I didn't know how. I didn't ask him, well, how big of the church is. I didn't ask him, well, how much money are you going to give me? It, it, you know what I did? I heard a cry. Because if you get in ministry for your benefit and you don't get in the ministry for the cry to lift up humanity, you should not be in ministry. Yeah. You should not be in leadership unless you want to answer a cry of hurting people. Come on. Because, if our, because then you will not answer because it's in it for you, in it for your title. I got a title. I got profit in front of my name. But you don't hear the cry. My title doesn't give me permission to be arrogant. It only, me commit, it only gives me permission to lift up people. That's it. That's it. It says, God opened her eyes. I love this. I love this. Here she was. She went over and she lift blind. But when she went over to lift her son up, God opened her eyes to what? A well of water. Not a skin of water, not a cup of water, but a well of water. Oh, church, because you know why? If God opened her eyes to her skin, she's in the problem the next day. I don't want God to open my eyes to the same situation that I've been in. Come on. I want my God to open my eyes to something bigger. God opened her eyes because she was willing to lift somebody up. Because I'm going to tell you something. Because what God said to the, what God is saying to this church, God wants to make this church a well. Are you hearing what I'm saying? A well, not only a spiritual well, but an economic well. God, there's this little town. Come on, how would you like uh, Rhinebeck to be a well? Come on, how would you like your city to be a well? How would you like to be a well? Oh, come on. I don't want to be a cup of water because when I'm a cup of water, I can only give you what I can carry. But if I'm a well, oh, look out. Oh, look out. And you know what we need right now in the church today? We don't need skins of waters or cups of waters. We need a well of water. Because let me just, uh, I will tell you right now, our denomination could die unless there's a well. So what we need is churches that are a well of living water. Because when you're a well, the adulterer can show up and get delivered. When the well, the broken can get, show up and get delivered. The rejected can get healed. Are you hearing me? When you are a well, God wants to make your business a well. God wants to make your marriage a well. God wants to make your ministry a well. Oh, hear me. A well of water. See, I, I want to be a well. Because when I'm a well, I can give like crazy. I mean, I, this is how crazy we are. So I am in Kentucky in August. 
The next, my, and we're doing a conference in, in, the last weekend in August, first weekend in September over in Maui, and I'm praying. I'm praying with a group of people, and Meliana's there, and I pray, oh, God, please give me $10,000 so I can give it to my home church. I pay my tithe. My wife looks at me and goes, you want to give $10,000? I said, yeah, honey. I'm a whale. Now, I didn't have $10,000. So Sunday morning, the last, actually the next day, it was the next day, I prayed that on Saturday. On Sunday morning, I'm on the platform. I walk off the platform to dismiss, to clo- and the service is closing. I walk off the platform, walk over, walk over there, Steve. And there's a gentleman there, him and his wife, they flew from Los Angeles to Nashville to be a part of the conference, to attend the conference. He stands up, I hug him, <clears throat> and he hands me a check for $10,000. <laughs> well, well. How many know when you lift people up, yes. God is a well? In church, I can sit here all night. That's how we live. Yes. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, uh, because you know why? When you lift people up, yes. God will make you a well. Yes. Because some of you broke, you shouldn't be broke. Because you know how do you get out of your poverty? Go lift somebody up. Go find somebody to lift up. Find somebody to encourage. If you, and let me just tell you, don't go into business to make money. Go into business to lift people up. Because if you will go into business to lift people up, God will make you a well. Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't go into ministry just so you can feel good about yourself. Go into ministry to lift people up and God will bless your church or God will bless your ministry. God will bless your preaching. God will bless your prophesying. If you, if you want, he said, I'm having, I'm having a problem in my marriage. Go lift up another marriage. Hey, you got to understand something. My wife and I, we, this is way back in the day. We're in, our, we're in our late 20s. This is 25 years ago or more. And so, so, so we, we, we decided we're going to go marriage class. And, and, and then we were so excited because the guy that was doing the marriage class said we could be a facilitator. <laughs> I thought that was cool. And so we decided to be a facilitator. And so we was all excited. We'd be a facilitator. I said, honey, we're facilitators. And then, the, and then we, so we had our own marriage class. And, and here we've been married not even 10 years to a couple years or so. No, five years, probably five years because the kids were really small. And, 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 and we, we, we were ministering to people that had been married two or three times. And then, and then, see, because we would drive over in a life group, we, we'd get in the car, and her and I would fight all the way to the marriage class. <laughs> and, and, and we wanted to kill each other before we got in the class. I don't even remember what we were fighting about, do you, honey? Probably my, probably my attitude. <laughs> Listen to whatever your wife no. <laughs> and you know what we did? We sit in the car. Get out of the car, put on a face. <laughs> and you know what would happen? Yeah. We'd walk over there in our own mess. Yeah. Yeah. Our own mess. Yeah. And lift those couples up yeah. who had been married a lot longer than we had. And many more times than we had. But we lift them up. We'd prophesy over them. Pray for them. And we'd walk out of there. Mm-hmm. I'm a well. I forgot I fight, honey. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, because here's what we do. We, we stay in our mess because we don't lift people up. And so we never become the well that God, because here's what God wants to do. God wants to make New Life Church a well in this county. Because this church, I'm prophesying right now, this church is going to get a reputation within this movement and within this church and around this area all the way throughout the state that if you want to go get water, go to New Life Church. There's a well in this house. There's a well in this house. There's a well in this. Oh, are you hearing me? 
Because when you become a well, you turn the desert into a garden. When you're a well, you don't have to borrow. When your life is a well. When your life is a well. And when your daughter calls you tell her, tell, to tell you she's going through a divorce. When you're a well, you, don't, you have something to access. I can drink of the water of that well. Now hear me. And I'm going to close. Hagar's a well now. Because the blessing of God will cause you to forget your rejection. I'm so blessed I don't have that time to be rejected. No, 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 hear me. No, hear me. No, hear me. I don't have time to be up with Sarah or Abraham. Because if they hadn't kicked me out, I wouldn't have discovered my own will. Oh, come on. If they had not rejected me, I would have never realized that, that God, because you know who dug that well? God dug that well. Because when God digs a well for you, nobody can stop it up. That means God was, uh, God was ready sending his angels to dig a well and as soon as Sarah went over there and as soon as she obeyed the word. Because when God digs a well, he digs it now. Now, church, you may not like Ishmael. I know they don't like Ishmael in Iowa. But God likes him. Because whether you believe this or not, it's the truth. That well is still flowing. It's called oil. Called oil because God's a God of covenant. Because His covenant is bigger than who we like. Now, church, can you imagine? Can you imagine if Hagar didn't go over there and lift up her son? Because right now, if OPEC decides, hey, let's raise the barrel of oil for $50 more, the whole world economy is affected. Yes, yes, yes. Because, ladies and gentlemen, God wants to make you a well. Amen. Lift your hands toward heaven right now. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I pray that you would make every single person within the sound of my voice a well of living water. I pray that the, this church and the churches that are represented here and the ministries that are represented here tonight would become that well of water to, to, to heal the most rejected, most marginalized, unloved, and unwanted generation in the history of America. I pray that it, even within the assemblies of God, this church would be a well of water. That our lives would be a well. Because when we're a well, we can draw from that water, that endless supply, and we can give it to others. And, we, and, and they are made alive by that well that you have dug. And I pray in the name of Jesus that every son, every daughter, every man, every woman... Old to young, within the sound of my voice tonight, would become a well. Would become a well. You can put your hands down right now. You know why I want to be a well? I want to be a well so I can be generous. I want to be a well so that the generosity of God, I can distribute it all over the place. Because if I'm not a well, I can't give nothing. So I'm, I pray every day, oh God, make me and my family a well. When I'm a well, I don't have to worry about welfare. I don't have to be entitled because God begged me a well. And I'm never going to have to worry about anything I don't have to be concerned about things because all I have to do is, John, just keep lifting people up. And I'll dig you a well. You know, Tracy, I think God wants to give you and Jeff more than one well. I want to thank you God wants to give you not seven, but eight wells. Eight wells. Everybody say, I agree with that. Eight wells. Come on. I agree with that. But sometimes, you know, you need a lot of wells these days. Eight properties, not just one property. I want to be I want to be a well. 
Here's what I'm going to do. We're, we're going to sow into this, into, this, into this word right now. Because every time, let me say it, every time you sow, you're lifting up. You're helping me lift up those Lithuanians that you will never meet. You're helping me lift up. I'm going to Belize a week from today. I'm going over to Belize. A week from tomorrow, excuse me. You help me to lift up that nation. You help me, you'll help me. They're paying my trip, but my trip trip to the Philippines is costing me well over ten thousand dollars right over there to go over there. Because my kids are going and, and, and a team is going with me. And every time I, I go over there, we're lifting that nation up. And I want to tell you something tonight. It's a privilege being a well. And you're, you're helping. Every time you buy products, you're helping us to, to, to go overseas. Because all that money that brought, bought the products, basically what it does is we set it aside for our overseas trips. You become a well. I want to be a well, not only economically, but a prophetic well. A well of healing. A well of peace. A well of revelation. You know what I love about I, met, I love about Gail? Gail is a well of revelation. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He's a well. And so that is why people, that is why that we need to access that kind of well. Because they, they, they're, they've got so much, a never-ending source. Because God dug it for them. Pastor. Man, we want to move quickly here and uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to ask um, our Hanai daughter if she would come and uh, hold one of these, these baskets. She's going to represent Passion Ministries, John and Meliana Harkey. You know, the kingdom of God is a lot of times counterintuitive. And a mindset of scarcity doesn't produce a well. Hoarding, hoarding what you have, hoarding your water doesn't produce a well. Just ask the Dead Sea. Just ask the Dead Sea. If there's no outflow, if there's no, if there's no pouring out, there's no infilling. There's no well that's going to be established there. And so in the kingdom, we have a mindset of abundance. We understand that it doesn't matter if I pour this out because God's going to just pour more in. And so right now you have an opportunity to step into this word to be a well, to be a well. And so we're going to pour out. We're going to pour out. We're going to pour out and allow God to pour into us. And so as we get ready to give, we're going to ask for you to come step out from where you're seated and to bring your gift for Passion Ministries. Every, every dollar, every dime is going to go to Passion Ministries, to John and Meliana Harkey, to, to fuel the, the mission of God, to fund the work that they're doing all across the world to establish, get this, they're not just a well. Everywhere they go, they're depositing wells. They're depositing wells. They're depositing wells. You're sending them to deposit well after well after well after well. We're going to see this earth flooded for Jesus. Amen. So I want to pray. We're going to move right into altar ministry. I want you to bring your gift up here. Put it right in here in this sack. If this one gets full, we've got another one. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord God, for the gift and the giver. I thank you, Lord, for a people of faith who operate from a, a mindset of abundance, understanding who it is that they serve. Lord, that you own a cattle on a thousand hills. Hallelujah. Lord God, that everything, Lord, in this earth belongs to you. God, that you are their source. And so, God, we, we look through the lens of faith, Lord God. We don't think through, through lack. We don't think, Lord God, through a, a mindset of scarcity. But right now, I pray over your people, Lord, God, that faith would rise up. Lord God, that they would trust you. God, trust you for their provision and whatever it is that you lay on their heart to give right now, they'd be faithful, they'd be obedient to that thing, Lord. And God, as we sow into this ministry, Lord, I know that there's gonna be a blessing that is reaped, Lord God. As we step into this prophetic word, Lord God, that we will be a well, Lord, as we pour out. God, I pray you pour fresh into each and every one right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, come on now, come on right now. James, lead us, would you? There's a mighty river flowing. There's a mighty river flowing in this place. There's a mighty river flowing. There's a mighty river flowing in this place. Full of power, full of 
glory it's in this place oh it's full of passion full of power full of glory it's full of grace as soon as you're given your gift please don't leave don't leave altar ministry is about to begin it's going to be powerful Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Michaela and Andy, would you guys come? Thank you, Carissa. Husband and wife. You guys is in high school. Of course, the older you get, it's harder to tell people's age. Why don't you stretch forth your hands to this precious couple? Thank you for grabbing hold of your wife's hand. I want to say this to you guys. You guys have been through some desert times. You guys have been through some family situations that have not been easy. You guys have been through some moments of rejection marginalization even talked about but God wanted me to tell you tonight he's putting a well in you son that you don't have to rely on somebody else that you don't have to be controlled by people You will make a way because God will make a way for you. But there's something you have to do. There's something that God wants you to do. That little wifey of yours standing next to you, you have to promise to lift her up. Because that's all she wants. She, it's not the house, not the car not the American dream that she wants the most. She just wants her husband to lift her up. Her, she wants her husband to make her great. That's why she married you. And if you'll do that, I promise, I will give you an inheritance that will begin to start generation after generation after generation. So, I'll break curses. I'll break strongholds. I'll break strongholds of men in the house that did not put God first. I'll cause men to serve me in the house. I'll cause men to rise up. Because women are serving, but the men are MIA. Because for some reason, the spirituality of the men is weighing and being, being marginalized and being destroyed in this state. But I want you to be different. I want you to be a real man. And a real man lifts up his family. Daughter, I heard this. You know a little bit about rejection. Meliana, would you come over here, please? And I heard the voice of the Lord say this. There's someone close to you in your family that you have to lift up right now. And yes, it's going to be inconvenient. Yes, it's going to be a struggle. But if you will do it, I will give you the water that you need. You will not run dry. Father, from the top of their head to the sole of their feet, put your hand on her womb right now, please. I pray that you fill it full of children right now. 
pray that you give her three children. <laughs> I pray, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that these children will lift people up. Because that's what mama does. That mama would make her children great. In the name of Jesus. Touch her right now in Jesus' name. There it is. God is touching you right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we give God a shout of praise in the house right now? Can we give God a shout of praise? How many want to be a well? How many want to be a well? Mike, would you stand up? I love my armor bearer. My armor bearer does not have permission to fall out. Okay, just tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he did last year. He did last year. There's a dent in the concrete, too, I tell you. Like that. We had to fix it. We had to take a special offering just for it. Yeah. I want you to stretch forth your hands. To my... Mike, I'm going to tell you something. Your gold, bro. God says you're gold. And because you're gold, oh, there's, there's the wifey. Praise Jesus. Thank you, wife. I'm going to tell you something, you guys. I want you to put your hand on his heart. What's, what's, her, what's his wife's name? Sarah. Sarah and Mike. You, you listen to Sarah. Mike listens to Sarah. <laughs> it means princess. It really does. Sarah, God spoke to me when you came up here. And the reason why you put your hand on Mike's heart because tonight his heart's being healed. he has such a heart for God he has such a heart for people and a few years ago he got rejected in ministry but what you did is you put your hand on his heart and said son said honey they may have not wanted you, but I love you. I love you. Because you were there for him. Because, you see, Sarah, you know what you did? You lifted up Mike. You did. That's why Mike's a well. That's why God's healed Mike completely. And healing him right now. God's going to restore Mike to ministry. God's going to restore Mike fully. God's going to restore strength in him, inside of him. And he's going, to be do th he's going to be able to do things like a 20-year-old. Because you put your hand on his heart and said, I believe in you. Sometimes you've had to fight for Mike. Because Mike's not a fighter. He's a lover. That's why God puts you together. <laughs> because she, she, she has a little mean streak sometimes. <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a righteous one. It's a righteous. It's a righteous. It's, 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 a, it's righteous. It's a righteous indignation. It's a, it's a righteous anger. Especially when it comes to your family. And God wanted me to tell you both. There's going to be a day when God's going to literally put you both in full-time ministry. He says, I have a place for you. Mike told me that you guys drive about 35 miles away from here. doesn't matter to you. Sometimes you can't make it, but most of the time you are here. 
Thank you for hearing the cry in Rain Day. Hearing the cry. Hearing the cry of the leadership. Send us help. Send us help. Send us help. And because you're serving, your well will never run dry, son. And I lay my hands if I can reach my sh your shoulders. I'm going to lay my hands on your shoulders. And the Spirit of God is going to empower this couple. I'm going to tell you, Mike, you won't preach the paint off the walls. You're going to shout from the rooftops. God is doing a work inside of you that is so huge. And your heart has the capacity to carry anything. Your heart has it. Your heart has the capacity to carry rejected people. Because you can feel when somebody's rejected. Test them right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless them right now. Bless this precious couple right now in the name of Jesus. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful tonight? Aren't you thankful tonight? Aren't you thankful tonight? Aren't you thankful tonight? I have to do something really quickly. It's my mistake. I'm going to ask for ushers to pass out the black books real quickly. Because if you received a word tonight, we want to make sure and get that to you. So if you can give us your email address. We're doing this very quickly. Ushers, move right now. If you could please pass out the black books. And then I want to say this. There's two people in this room who are going to understand what this means. I'm going to ask you to come up. These two words, hula girl. Hula girl. There's two, there's two people in this room that understand what hula girl means. You're one of them. Where's the other one? There you are. Hula girl. Hula girl. It's you, right? Yeah. I believe God has something for you. Stretch forth your hands to Carissa right now. Meliana, would you lay hands on her? Well, she's, I've been prophesying her at dinner all the time. Poor girl. You've asked the Lord, you said, Lord, what's my place? Where do I fit in? What's my place in the economy of God? Where's my, where's my niche? Because I don't just want to spin my wheels. I don't want to just kind of tread water. I want to do something that's significant. Tonight, the Spirit of God, I, as I was preaching about courage and boldness, all of a sudden, I looked at you, and the Lord said this to me. He said, I am baptizing my daughter with more courage and more boldness than she ever knew she had. Yeah. And as she's making this transition and will make this transition, the Lord says, it's going to take great courage and great boldness. Because there's going to be people that you love and people that you care about. Says, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? But when you stand with courage and boldness, and not let because see see nobody should talk to be able to talk you out of a word from God. Nobody should be able to back you in the corner. You shared with us at lunch about how the horse fell on you. The Lord says, I'm not going to let anybody paralyze you from doing what God has called you to do. And that was a prophetic sign that nothing could paralyze you. Nothing could. Not words, not misunderstanding, not even people saying, oh, she made a mistake. What's she doing? 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 
that's, that can't paralyze you because you are a woman of courage. And Minister Megan, could you come up here because I want you to lay hands on her because I believe that there's an impartation of courage that's going to come on her because you're going to need it. You're, you're going to need courage and boldness. You're not standing in rebellion. You're not standing against it. No, I don't agree. You're, you're standing in the courage of the Lord. Because you want to experience things in your life because it's going to broaden your perspective. I'm going to say this to you. You are going to be a well of servanthood in your life. You are going to be the greatest servant. Because the Bible says the great one is the one that serves. Because you know what? When you were younger, you wouldn't even have got up here and danced like you did tonight. You'd have been too embarrassed. But you did it because you wanted to serve. You came to this conference because you wanted direction. And not only did you get direction, you got a confirmation. You got both. Because you're a servant. And what you're going to do is you're going to teach the church how, what it means to serve. Yes. To serve one another. That's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to do. Well, I'm 18. But you've been a servant all your life. You served your dad. You served your daddy. And you served your daddy well. That's why he loves his daughter so much you serve your daddy you've been your daddy you, 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 you have been the encouragement you have been you have even lift up your daddy you have done that you were 9, 10 years old you were lifting him up when he felt like oh what am I doing you went over there and he'd come home and you would be lifting him up you'd be right there to lift him up father from the top of her head to the sole of her feet father as I lay hands on her I release that courage and the boldness, that apostolic courage, an apostolic boldness, a book of Acts courage in the name of Jesus. I like my sister right here. Yes, yes, I want you to lay hands on her. You guys got courage, so I want you. I want you to lay hand on her and that anointing of courage to be transferred. Hallelujah. Come on and give God a shout of praise. Stress both your hands to her. I saw this in my spirit. I saw you waving a flag, like flagging, that's what they call that in charismatic churches. And I said, Lord, what does that mean? And the Lord says, You were waving a flag over this state, over this area. We were waving a flag of spiritual freedom that they've never had before. Because they haven't experienced what true freedom is, what true liberty is like. And I felt like the Lord has sent you here to break people out of prison. And that you are carrying Holy Spirit, spiritual dynamite on the inside of you. That you can't go in the way, like, you know, stick the key in and, or a combination and get them, get them out of their cell. That you had to go through another way and actually blow a wall out. Because there, there, there is a, a certain craziness and wildness that you carry, says the Lord. And God is getting the combination ready. God is getting some things together where you're going to be able to bust people out of a religious prison and let them experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord says that every time you wave a flag, every time you worship, just like in the book of Acts, people are being bust out of prison. So that means that you can't hold back. You can't even hold back in places that don't do that. 
You have to be the instigator. You have to be the one that they get. You have to become the forerunner. And God brought you here to be a forerunner. Because you have certain relationships, certain connections that God has connected you with and connected you to. And he says this, if you will do that, I will fill the house. You know what? The Bible says that all the men of debt and the men that were disgusted, they were busted, came to the cave of Adullam. They went into a cave because there was a man named David because it was a man after the presence of God. And the people are going to run to churches to find people that are after the presence of God. You're one of them. You're one of them that God is raising up. Father, from the top of her head to the sole of her feet, as I lay hands on her, may she never be the same again. Father, touch her right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. There it is. God is touching you right now. Hallelujah. Come on and give God a shout of praise. Give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. 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 You, you, you got to understand, I'm wild, charismatic, Pentecostal, word of faith. I believe it all. I, I believe Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen. I, I believe I, I, I believe it all. I believe in John Gray. I believe in T.D. Jakes. I, I believe in Bill Johnson. I believe everything that's the Holy Ghost, I want it all. Are you hearing what I'm saying? How many want it all? I want everything that God has. I want everything that God has. I want you to stand up all over the room. I want you to stand up all over the room. How many want to be that well? How many want to be that well tonight? How many want to be that well? I'm the, how many say, preacher? I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to find somebody to lift up. I'm going to find me somebody under a bush, somebody under under a tree, somebody in a church, somebody in a house, somebody locked up. I'm going to lift them up. They may be right next to you. They may be behind you. Maybe your own family. And I thought about that and I shared my testimony about my daughter Leilani this morning. And I'm just, I'm, I'm standing here tonight. I'm so glad that my wife and I just started to lift her up to make her great. How many want to lift people up to make them great? If that's the cry of your heart, this is what I say. I would suggest you do this. Because you want to be a well, you lift them up to make them great. Then you better run to this altar on the count of three. One, two, three. I'd run, I'd, I'd run if I was you. I'd run if I was you. I'd run if I was you. I'd, I'd run if I was you. I, I would. 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 I saw your video. Amazing. I wept. Thank you for being so transparent. Where's your husband? Thank you. Thank you for sharing your life. Thank you for making people great. Congregation, shut forth this couple. Shut forth this couple. You grab your wife's hand. That's your, that's your son? Hey, bro. Thank you. You're part of this prophecy, too. Put your hands on your parents' shoulders. Yeah, yeah. The Lord says this, family. From now on, from this night on, there is a future. A future that is going to lead you down a path where all of a sudden you're going to point to things and pray over things. And there's going to be radical prayers that are answered. You know how I prayed for the $10,000? There's going to be supernatural provision that's going to come to you. Because you, you too 
do what most people don't do. You don't, most people won't share their most intimate stories and their most intimate pain. And the Lord says, because you did that, you lifted up my people and gave people hope that you will never meet. And because you gave your wife permission to share her story, the Lord says this to you. When you stretch forth your hands and you need a house, when you need a field, when you need opportunities to come your way, I'm telling you, it will come automatically because I will bring it to you. When you need equipment, I will give it to you. When you need a truck, I will give it to you. When you need to have your son pay for his college, I will give it to you. When, when, when your, your family has a need, they will call on you and you will become that well to your family, son. Because what you did is you lifted up this wifey of yours. Yes, yes, yes. Because you, what you did is you allowed her to be like Jesus. You allowed her to fulfill John 8 when Jesus knelt down and wrote in the sand. She wrote her story in the sand. So everybody could read it. Because you allowed her to do that. This family. God is going to prosper this family and daughter. is going to turn into a diamond. Because as Meliana had her hand on you, are a diamond. You're getting an upgrade. You're getting more than a suite. You're getting a house. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I'm telling you by the Spirit. People, someone is going to give you a house. I'm telling you, God's going to do supernatural miracles for you two guys, just like he does. People are going to give you cars and houses. People are just going to walk up to you out of the blue and just say, I feel like blessing you because you lifted up. And I'm going to say this to you. Daughter, you are so whole on the inside. So whole. See, you're going to be so whole, you are so whole, that you'll have to, you just forget about your rejection, because I'm just so busy being blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this family. Son, I'm going to tell you something. You're like super, super smart. Super smart. Huh? I'm lying. I'm lying. I ain't lying. The devil's a liar. Prophets don't lie. You're so smart. But God says, I want you to apply what I gave. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to come, come, come here. I'm going to lay a hand on your forehead. If I could get someone to hold my mic, I'd really appreciate it. As I put my hand on your forehead, I, I, I just feel like there's been this, this struggle with procrastination where you you were so smart you know how to do so many things but you kind of put the responsibility on the shelf because you wanted to play 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 and what I'm going to I want to tell you something I'm going to tell you something video games aren't going to cause this mind of yours to do what it's called to do what's going to call this mind of yours to do what you call to do is applying what you know. Because I need you to help. I need you to help the other kids. I need you to help the other kids. And the Lord says this to you right now. If 
you'll help the other kids, I'll help you. Because you've got enough intelligence that you could create a video game. Yes. I'm going to use technology. And I'm going to bless you with technology, son. But you got to let me. I want you to start your own company before you're 17. This is not an option. Not an option. You can do it. 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 But it's going to take some work. Touch him right now in Jesus' name. There it is. God is touching you. Never be the same. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, come on and give God a shout of praise right now. Give him a shout of praise. I, I told you I'd lay hands on everybody. Can we worship? 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 We worship you, Lord Jesus. Just worship him. Just worship him. Just worship him. We worship you, Jesus.
this fear is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here, overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us, you're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the
Before I spoke a word, you sing. <laughs> Come on, just worship Jesus right now. Worship Jesus right now. Come on. You're not going to get anything from spectating. You're not going to get anything from spectating. Come on, press into the presence of the Lord. Press into the presence of the Lord. It's about, it's about what he's doing in you right now. It's not about what he's doing in somebody else. It's about what he's doing in you. Come on, worship Jesus right now. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night denied. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming Some of you right now are wondering what in the world is happening. It's the overwhelming love of God. It's the overwhelming love of God. That's it. That's it. It's the overwhelming love of God that we're experiencing in this house. And here's the thing about the overwhelming love of God. You can resist and reject him. You can reject it. You're just hurting yourself. There's a love of God that surpasses understanding. There's a love of God that goes so much farther than any human love we've ever experienced. That's why it's so overwhelming. It's nothing we've ever experienced in this life. When we encounter the love of God, it just overwhelms. It just does. Come on, let's just, let's just rejoice in that love tonight. Let's worship Jesus. Thank you for your love, Lord. Wash over us with your love, Lord. It's so overwhelming. Hallelujah. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, oh yes, reckless love. Oh. 
jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections for me and he loves us oh how he loves in his eyes if grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss my heart turns violently inside of my chest and I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way come on sing it he loves us oh how he loves I say he loves me, he loves me, he loves me.
put your hand on your heart all over the room. I want you to say this after me. Jesus. Tonight, Tonight. I have a mandate mandate. to lift up a generation. generation. I have a mandate mandate. to make people great. great. Lord Jesus, Jesus. empower me now. Even in the middle of my own, of my own issues and personal weakness, empower me to lift others up. Lord, I ask you, make my life a well, a well of spiritual water so others can drink from it. Lord Jesus, Jesus. make my business business a well, well. my church a well, well. my family a well, well. in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Lord God, God, I thank you you for speaking to me. me. Tonight, Tonight, I have no more rejection. I don't have time. I'm too busy to be rejected. Because I'm so busy lifting up others. In the name of Jesus. Now lift your hands and thank you. Set a fire down in my soul. 